Okay, so maybe I'll start. The, so to, to bring you back then to what we've been doing so far, let's see, we're in, I think we're at our fifth lecture now. Uh, is that right? Something like that. Uh, so, and so far we've been, we've been focused on this, this uh, decade, largely focused on this decade from 1958 to 1968. Uh, this marked, as I say, a watershed period in, in the study of quantitative bacterial physiology. So we'll, we'll wrap that up, I mean, in the next moment or two, and then we'll turn our focus to more recent developments. So when I say recent, I mean, I mean very literally even within the last 10 years. And so to bring you way back, the first lecture we talked about Minode's review of 1949, and uh, two, two uh, pieces of information that came out of that that I'd like to remind you of is his, his uh, Minode kinetics for the growth rate. So if you had the concentration of some growth limiting substrate, the growth rate looked approximately like this hyperbolic relationship if we grew the, the cells in batch growth. And you could characterize the growth rate in terms of two parameters then, the maximal growth rate when the substrate is, is saturating and the affinity, if you like, of the, the uh, bacterium for the substrate. Okay, and then the, the, another part of that review that we've talked about, which I think is going to be important today, is this growth yield. And so here he was looking at the, not the uh, concentration, but the, the literal amount of uh, growth limiting substance that was in the test tube to begin with. So he would change that and then measure the amount of cells that grew out of that substrate. And there was, over a large range and over many different nutrients, you get a linear relationship that passes almost through zero. Uh, and this was called the growth yield. So this was how much bacteria you got from how much nutrient. It's like the efficiency of conversion, if you like. All right. We left behind MOLA. We went to, or sorry, we left behind Monod. We went to MOLA. And uh, we saw these empirical relationships that they found for the growth rate dependence of the macromolecular composition of bacteria. And here we focused on three state variables, well, four if you count the growth rate, the uh, RNA per cell, the DNA, the DNA per cell, and the mass per cell, and they all had their characteristic growth dependence. They were all monotonically increasing with growth rate change the way that they changed it, which was by changing the nutrient quality the cells were growing in. And then we spent probably three or four lectures going more deeply into the origins of these. Now, we didn't go deep enough that we talked about molecular origins, and that would take something like 40 or 50 years, and that's still ongoing. But for our purposes, what I want to focus on in this course is descriptions of this level and this level. Right? So we have these, these rule-based phenomenological uh, results, and we ask, what could be what could, how could we rationalize these, these behaviors? Okay, and that led to Helmsetter and Cooper's elegant experiments looking at multi-fork replication of the DNA which then explained this DNA per cell and to some extent the mass per cell. Because remember this mass per cell growth dependence can be, can be sort of uh, rationalized by looking at the time it takes for DNA rate to increase to a new rate upon switching to faster medium and the cell numbers to also change to this new rate. And there's a difference of about 65 minutes there, which is almost exactly the amount of time it takes to initiate chromosome replication duplicate the chromosome, separate, and then divide. All right, and so here we have, with, with Helmsetter Cooper, we have at least at this level of mechanism an explanation for these two curves. And then early on in this lecture series, we talked about this RNA per cell being rationalized by, so what we really talked about was the ratio of this line to this line, being rationalized in terms of the, the protein uh, production. The protein production is driven by ribosomes and most of the cellular RNA is ribosome-affiliated RNA. All right, that was a whirlwind recap of what we've done so far. But I, I put this up here because I want to come back to it when we talk about the, the modern developments. Bless you. So let me pause there. Are there any questions about what we've done so far? I mean, it, it can be anything from Minode to, to what we did yesterday. Bless you again. Any questions? All right, so let's, let's journey into the modern era. So this is now modern uh, bacterial physiology.
Uh, and for almost 40 years, this type of experimentation uh, became more or less extinct. Uh, and the reason for that, I mean, it's, there are many reasons, of course, but some of the main reasons are because uh, people became more and more interested in, in molecular mechanisms. So Minode, for example, won his Nobel Prize around this time for showing how, uh, how protein regulates its own expression or the expression of other proteins in the cell by binding to DNA and shutting off transcription. People became very excited about this and then started exploring the consequences and the uh, networks that emerged from that sort of picture. And that's been ongoing for, say, 60 years. Um, the other reason, I, one reason, is that uh, Minot passed away in the, in the early 70s. And, I mean, quite unexpectedly. And so that arrested, to some extent, some of the few physiologists that were still interested in these types of questions. And then finally, there was a huge push in the early 1970s to uh, solve cancer. This is Nixon's big push to, to cure cancer. And so people turned away from bacteria, largely. But that's changing. And, there are, and that change is being carried out, for the most part, by physicists who are going into biology. And so I think that's potentially why Matteo asked me to talk at this school. I'm not sure. But I'll tell you some of that, and then you tell me if it's I interesting. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, actually. You, don't, you can tell me if it's interesting, but more I want to know if you have any questions. So let's talk about the modern biology, and I'll tell you what's changed in the 50 years since, since uh, Monod or, and Mola. Uh, so not uh, much um, in this area for about, um, say, 50 years. Well, I'll say 40 years. It's not to say that everyone stopped. There were isolated pockets, but it didn't dominate the thinking of the biological community as it once did. The mindset or the, the say, the spirit of the people changed. Uh, so that, that, that changed. That is starting to change. And two, two developments, at least in the last 10 years, uh, are the following, so two big changes, big changes are one, an appreciation for constraints in, the, uh, in cellular growth, if you like. Or better to say, a quantification. of resource allocation constraints, resource, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. In bacterial growth, and technological developments that have allowed us to visualize and record with high fidelity single cell growth. And so, if you like, this is a legacy of MOLA, and this is a legacy of Helmstetter and Cooper. So single cell technology, let's say. In real time. Okay, and this is, so this carries on Mola's leg or uh, Mola's legacy and this is Helmstetter's legacy. So we may talk a little bit about this. It's it's asking more detailed questions about the cell cycle and the dependence of cell cycle on different um, methods of growth and inhibition. Uh, but I'll focus on this. This is the material that I know best. And so this is then asking about this type of phenomenological picture, but in different scenarios, in a different context of growth. OK, and so what we could do is, uh, and, and what has been done, is to repeat Helmstetter's analysis on a single strain under different conditions of growth, repeat MOLAs on the same strain, different conditions of growth, 
what I mean is different uh, nutrient environments, uh, and then go deeper and deeper and deeper and say, okay, well, how many ribosomes precisely are there? How many RNA polymerases precisely are there? And things like this. Okay, and that, that has been done. So in the intervening decades, um, we have much more detail, but no sort of changes in the, in the big picture, if you like. Uh, we've collected uh, many details. The big picture remains. All right. And now, now I want to contrast all of this work with, with something that we haven't really spoken about. Uh, and that is how we change the doubling rate. So in all of what we've talked about, in all we've discussed, the growth rate has been changed or modulated by changing the quality of the growth environment, by changing the sugar source, by giving it different nutrients, whatever it might be. Right. Uh, growth rate. modulated by uh, nutrient quality. All right, we, and I'll, I'll contrast that with other modes of growth inhibition in a second. So this, this of course, is just you change the chemical recipe of what you're feeding them, their diet, if you like. But now we can ask questions like, what if we want to see how bacterial physiology alters when we treat them with antibiotics, for example? Or if you're more physically oriented, you might be thinking, well, what if we change the pressure or the osmolarity? Or what if we change the temperature? All of these are natural buttons to twist as a physicist or as an engineer or as a process design engineer. But for the biologists at this time, the most natural buttons to change were carbon source, nitrogen source, enrichment for amino acids, and so on. Now, if we do want to change to different growth strategies, what are we going to do? Right? Are we going to repeat then all of this detailed measurements of the intervening decades, so 30 years worth of experiments, to count how many ribosomes there are at this temperature and this pressure and so on? I mean, that's one way to do it. And that would be a brute force sort of, uh, let's say, statistical mechanics approach. But what I want to talk about here is a more thermodynamics, phenomenological approach. So what I'm going to outline are some other modes of growth change. And then let's talk about what I'm talking about. <laughs> OK, so we can imagine, you can imagine, let me put a but here. Imagine many ways to modulate growth. I mean, we, we can maintain exponential growth, but I hear I'm talking about changing how fast they double. And so we can think of, for example, physical per perturbations. And so these might be, say, temperature. Pressure. Osmolarity, osmotic pressure. And there are many uh, biophysics labs across the world that are looking at exactly these types of perturbations to growth. You can imagine chemical perturbations. So these would be, say, abiotics. or other inhibitors of growth. And so that's sort of redundant, but <laughs> what I mean here are, are clinical antibiotics or other types of, of growth inhibitors that you wouldn't necessarily give to a human or an animal. Uh, or you can think of biological. And so let me write this up, and then let's talk about all this. And so. For example, you may be using your bacterium as a factory for developing some bioproduct that you're interested in. Insulin was one of the first. 
So we manufactured, we didn't, but some, it has been manufactured, a uh, bacterium E. coli that produces insulin. And it can't possibly use the insulin, but we just feed it glucose, it makes insulin, we grind up the E. coli, purify the insulin, and give it to humans. We use E. coli to biomanufacture a very, at that time, expensive protein. Okay, so this is uh, protein production or bioproduct manufacture. Of course, if it's making something it doesn't need, it's going to do grow more slowly. <laughs> right. And uh, other things you could have toxic proteins, and we'll talk about that uh, probably not today, but next week. And so these are, I, I, I've just, I mean, these are fairly arbitrary distinctions, but I, I wanted to, to convey to you that changing the, the carbon source is not the only way to change the growth of these bacteria. And of course you knew that, but the kind of the variety is astounding because within each of these is, you know, hundreds of degrees of freedom, if you like. And what if you want to do simultaneously two or three? Would you then go in and categorize chemically the state of the bacterium in all of these different growth rates? It's almost unimaginable. I mean, it's possible that we come up with throughput technologies that allow us to do that, but then how do we make sense of this big data that accumulates, if you like? And so a counterpoint to all of this, or another way to look at this, is then to ask, can we generalize these types of relationships to arbitrary perturbations, and if we do do that, what do we learn about the growth of the bacterium? All right, so it's, I mean, I don't want to strain this analogy too much, but it's like Carnot asking, what's the efficiency, the, the best efficiency of a steam engine? Because, I mean, there's no use trying to build one that's better than that. Right? And so here what we're going to ask is, what's the maximal rate of growth for these bacteria under all these types of uh, constraints or, or inhibitions of their growth? All right, so that's the preamble that sets up the rest of the course, but let's, let me pause here. Is it, is it clear what I'm talking about when I talk about different ways to modulate growth? So there's, there's also, aside from this, the question of whether you want to grow your cells, you know, maybe you don't want them growing exponentially. Maybe you want to, you know, they saturate out, you take them out of your bioreactor and grind them up. That's a whole different engineering question. We're still going to be talking about balanced exponential growth, but we're gonna be changing that slope on a log linear scale. We'll be changing that exponential growth rate through different methods, not just by nutrient change. All right, so that's the, that's the scenario. Any questions about the scenario? It's okay? All right, so for this course, I'm gonna leave, I'm, I'm not gonna discuss these, right, um, largely because I don't have any data on them. Uh, I will talk about these for the most part, and, and I'll start here with chemical inhibitions and antibiotics. Okay, and then we'll go on to some of these biological ones which tie together this phenomenological picture that I'm about to talk about. All right, so before we, uh, we start talking about what's happened lately, let me bring you back to the Neidhart megasanic stuff we talked about in the second lecture, maybe even the first lecture. So let's talk about constraints on uh, protein synthesis. And so we had this idea that uh, the rate of protein synthesis Is, is linearly proportional to the number of, of active ribosomes in the cell. This was something that Me Megasanic and Neidhart inferred from their linear relationship between the RNA to protein ratio. I'm gonna remind you of all this in a second. But now we know mechanistically that this is true. We've, we've been able to reconstitute protein synthesis in a test tube. That was done quite early on, in the early 70s, and is now sort of routinely done. And so you can just add energy, ribosomes, and some substrate, and the ribosomes will churn out proteins. It's astounding. <laughs> so we know exactly what you need. Uh, and this is, is, turns out to be true. So the road is, is proportional to the 
uh, number of active uh, ribosomes. Okay, so the first underline is what's going to give me the equation that I'm about to write up. But the double underline is something we didn't talk about when we discussed Neidhart and Magasanic's work, which is that not all ribosomes necessarily need to be working. Okay, so what I mean by this is that suppose you have the mass of protein in a given volume or in a test tube or whatever. Here I'm not thinking of it as a per cell measure. I'm just thinking of it as a chemical measure. Take out a milliliter, measure how much protein is there in, in that milliliter in terms of its milligrams, and then see how rapidly this increases. We know in balanced growth, it's this. It's going to increase exponentially. And then from Neidhart and Magasanic, we had the Bless you. It was proportional to the number of ribosomes. And here I'm thinking of an inactive fraction that I'm going to. So these are inactive. Now, a, a person could imagine this two different ways. One could imagine that all ribosomes are active, but their rate of translation changes with growth rate. Or you could imagine that there's some small population that is not translating, not actively engaged in protein synthesis, but those that are translate at some maximal rate. Um, the, the truth is, is a combination of both, and we may, get that, we may get to that this afternoon. If not, it's in the lecture notes, but, uh, but it's, not, uh, it's a minor point. The reason that I write it this way is because I know that this relationship between the growth rate and the ribosome abundance is linear with a, with a, uh, a non-zero offset. So let me show you what I mean by that. All right. Let me just erase some of this. Okay, let me pause. Any questions about this, um, this expression? So when we were talking about it uh, at the beginning of the week, we had this claim by Neidhart and Magasanic that was then uh, used to rationalize the linear relationship between the RNA to protein ratio because this number of ribosomes was proportional to the abundance of RNA in the cell. That was their argument. I'm modifying it somewhat by allowing uh, some growth-independent offset. And I'll show you how that comes out in a second. So then in terms of, of RNA, we had that the number of ribosomes is proportional to the total RNA in the cell. And so then we had that the growth rate over some k hat was equal to some um, RNA to protein plus some um, you know, RNA not inactive, say, over total protein. And so then when we, we uh, sketch, sorry, there's a minus sign here. <laughs> so then when we sketch this, we had this RNA to protein. We had this growth rate. And we had a straight line. So Neidhart and Magasanic were interested in this, in this fast growth where this, this offset is sort of negligible compared to the changes in the, in the slope. But I want to come back to that offset. So that was Neidhart and Magasanic. Let me pause now. Any, any questions about any of that? I'm going through it fairly quickly, but it's, it's fine if we go through it in more detail. Can you explain again? I did not which, which part? So going from there to here? Which is from, from there, is that part okay? Okay. So then what you end up with is this, which is an algebraic equation. It's okay. Now divide both sides by MP and both sides by K. It's okay. 
So what I mean by RNA over protein is this, which is then converted into total RNA, which is why I had a hat on the K. It's just a proportionality constant. And then dividing through by the total protein mass gives me those ratios. Yeah? What is the RNA It's the inactive, the inactive ribosome component. So So that would be RNA affiliated with an inactive ribosome. Okay, not as message, but as structural RNA. It's okay. So, so the, the ribosomes are machinery that, that translate. If they're not actively translating, they're still, they're still made of RNA. Okay. So if you measure the total RNA, you'll still pick that up. Right? That, that'll be part of your measurement, but it won't be functional is the problem. That's a good, I mean, that's an important point. Is it clear to everyone? that these ribosomes are composed of RNA. That's their main structural element. And if they're not translating, you're still picking it up in the chemical reaction that tells you how much RNA is in the test tube. So they're sitting there. They're not driving any synthesis. They're not catalyzing any production. They're just you know, inert. But they're still made of RNA, and so they still count when you measure the total RNA. And so you still get this, this sort of offset, no matter what the growth rate is, you're still going to pick up some of these inactive ribosomes. So this would be then your RNA zero over total protein. So this is inactive. Does that, is that okay? It's okay? Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. And then the ribosomes are the machines which read the, the DNA no. and make RNA? No, there's an intermediary machine. Let's quickly go over that. OK, so part, part of the difficulty with the structure that we've had in this course is that the, all the biology I gave you in the first five minutes of the course, and it's not obvious what stuff you needed. So let's go back to it really briefly. So recall, this is sometimes called the, the central dogma of, of microbiology, or biology in general. So you have the DNA, and it's read by an RNA polymerase. Which we haven't talked about. And we haven't talked about that because I don't think it's limiting. So there's, there's a subpopulation of people that would dis disagree with me. But for, for our purposes, and because they're not here, let's assume it's not limiting. So this is an RNA polymerase, which turns it into RNA. Now, some of that RNA, the RNA that we're, we're typically thinking about when we're thinking of a biological scenario, is made into functional protein. Right? And it's made by uh, ribosomes. which make the protein. So about 5% of the total cellular RNA is, is what's called translated into protein. So this is about 5%. So 85% is ribosomal RNA. And it's, it's you know, used to make ribosomes, and by make, I mean it's a structural element. It's not changed. It's not interpreted. It's the chemical is literally folded up. You know, it's not. So when I mean literal, I mean it's not. It's not converted into protein or anything. The RNA just bundles up and makes its own machinery. So the ribosome is is two grams of this ribosomal RNA to one gram of uh, ribosomal protein. And so again, if, if we're talking about biological systems, very often we focus on enzymes, which are 100% protein, typically. Here's a machine that is you know, comparatively little protein. It has 54 of these little proteins stuck all over it. But it is, for the most part, just a tangle of 
ribosomal RNA. There are a couple of consequences of that, which I'll, I'll tell you right now, um, but it, it may not be relevant until later on, and then I'll remind you of it. So if it doesn't make sense, we'll come back to it. But let me pause. Is this picture... So again, this is something we talked about at the beginning, but it's not clear. It wasn't clear then in foresight what it was going to be used for. So now in hindsight, does anyone have any questions about these different processes? So this is genetic information. There's very little of this. I mean, it's a very long molecule, but there's only one chromosome. On the other hand, and it comes back to your point, is if this piece of DNA happens to be close to an origin of replication, well, then you're going to get duplicates of it as the cell replicates its origin, and so you'll get multiple copies of whatever piece of this DNA encodes. That's a small point I'll come back to. That gets turned into this helper molecule, the RNA, which then gets jumped onto by ribosomes and turned into protein, unless it's one of these ribosomal RNAs, in which case it just folds up and makes a ribosome. Okay, and then the missing 10% or 15% are what are called transfer RNAs, and they're what are responsible for bringing amino acids to the ribosome. But for now, we won't, we'll, we won't talk about them. They're going on in the background. I'll pause again. Any questions? K and K hat? So K hat would then be, if this thing is, say, uh, you know, say it's called sigma, or what do you want to call it? Let's call it, uh, what's the proportionality constant? Um, baby M times RNA. Is that okay? Where, where are you? There you are. Right, so then you would put that in here, and K hat would be, would be M times K. I'm just saying it's, it absorbs a proportionality constant. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? I convert from numbers to numbers of ribosomes to molecules of RNA. That means that this thing has the same interpretation. It's just got different units now. So is that okay? It's okay. Okay. Any other questions? Now back to you. Yeah, so now tell me your question again. So we have two machines here. Yeah. And there is something named uh, mRNA. Yeah. Which is this. this is what you call the mRNA. This is what's called the message. This is RNA. RNA. No, anything mRNA is turned into protein. So this is one special class of RNA. Then there's other RNA that's made by these guys that is never turned into protein. It, it's turned into ribosomes without any sort of uh, uh, interpretation. It just is the molecule com turns into the, to the machinery. It's okay. I feel like I've dwelled on it enough that I've maybe gone from it being confusing to clear to confusing again. So I can pull it back a bit. Does, does anyone have any questions about this process? Yeah? Could you say one more time? How could the ribosome be inactive? Inactive, okay. So, so, so then the question is, what is the origin of this inactivity? I think, so this is again, I, I'm conjecturing, but I think there's reasonable um, proof to, to back up some of this. One way that they can be inactive is that they need to find this RNA. They need to bind to it. And so that's a, that's a diffusive surf, search problem. And so if they're searching for RNA, they're not making protein. And so there's a time associated with that. Is that okay? And so some of them will be searching for RNA. Some of them will be on the RNA and waiting for amino acids to make this. And so again, it's a diffusive search problem, bringing amino acids to the ribosome to get incorporated into the protein. Those would also be inactive for a moment, you know, as they wait. And so those, I think, are the two main ones. The other one is that between the, the time it takes to make this RNA and then for it to fold up and be a functional ribosome takes a, a, you know, a couple of seconds maybe or a few minutes. And so that also, those would be inactive. 
There's this transit time. Those are probably the three big ones. And the two I said first are the biggest. That folding maturation time is pretty minimal. It's OK? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way, that's the first way that we're going to fiddle with this. So she's suggesting, I'm paraphrasing and, and interrupt me if I misrepresent you. So her suggestion is you could perturb growth, you could alter this by changing that or changing this. What was the other one? Those were the two? Yes, the question is uh, where do we intervene? We'll, we'll intervene here. So these, the, it's more uh, sort of. Yeah, it's more difficult to think about intervening here. It would take, well, yeah, so we, we focus here. So the antibiotics that I'll show you first are antibiotics that target this process. But there are other ways that we could intervene, which is that to make this protein, you need to supply with amino acids. And so if you cut off that supply chain, then that will change the growth rate as well. All right, let me pause. Any other questions? Really good. Those were really good. All right. Um, here we are. Yes. Okay. And this. Okay. Um, oh, I pushed too hard with my chalk. Okay. Um, so, like I say, ribosomes are mostly made out of ribosomal RNA structurally, but they do have a protein component. And for what I want to talk about today, Yep, still today, is, uh, oh, we have two lectures today, too. So what I want to talk about today is constraints, and it'll be easiest to see the type of constraints that I have in mind if we convert from RNA to protein. Okay, and that's going to be, a, a, again, another proportionality constant. And so I'm going to change the, the letter that I use. So the protein content of these ribosomes is fixed. And like I say, we, we now know the, the molecular origins of that, that uh, regulation. But for our purposes, take it as, a, as gospel, if you like. It's, it's fixed. You have a ribosome. You always have the same mass, if you like, of proteins associated with that ribosome. OK, so we can convert. convert from total RNA, and now I'll use some other proportionality constant. Uh, I don't want you to go crazy. Maybe I'll use sigma this time. Sigma times the R protein. So if the total amount of ribosomal RNA or RNA is proportional to the ribosomal RNA, and that in turn is proportional to the protein, ribosomal protein, we can re-express this fraction as ribosomal protein to total protein. And I'll write that up, and then let's talk about it. And then we have, if I plug this into here, I will have Lambda over, now I'm going to call this kappa T, and I'll tell you what kappa T is in a second. R protein per total protein minus R protein inactive over total protein, where this thing now is your original K times M times sigma if I haven't done anything wrong. But again, it, these m's and sigmas are just proportionality constants that make sure that my units are OK. But k still retains the meaning or the interpretation of the translation rate. Or I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to rewrite this as some fraction, r protein, Protonal protein, 
is going to be equal to lambda over kappa t plus this, now I'm going to call this phi r min. All right, and it's this equation, this uh, empirical relationship that I want to talk about today, at least for the first lecture, and we'll come back to it again in a second. But it's exactly the Neidhardt of Magasanic uh, relationship that we saw at the beginning of the, of the um, course, but now explicitly with an offset, which empirically we also observe. But the interpretation that this offset is ribosomes that are not driving protein synthesis and hence growth rate. So I've introduced two new, um, two new symbols, if you like. This phi, which is a protein to protein ratio. And this kappa, which has the same meaning that we had at the beginning of the week, which is a translation rate. How rapidly does one ribosome make protein? In this, in this scenario, it would be how many grams, how fast does one gram of ribosomal protein make another protein, if you like. Okay, let me pause though. Are there any questions up to this point? So the, the interpretation that we had previously re is retained. It's just an update to the symbols. And I promise you it's not a semantic update. I mean, it's not just superficial. That we'll gain some true insight by not looking at the RNA to protein ratio, but rather the protein to protein ratio. Okay? Let me pause though. Is that okay? Okay, let's look at some data then. So this guy then, the interpretation is that this is the protein synthesis rate rate uh, per mass of ribosome <coughs> protein. Okay, I put those in brackets because the original K was protein synthesis rate per ribosome in numbers. Then we converted that to the RNA mass of a ribosome. Then we converted that to the mass of a protein. But it doesn't, the interpretation is the same. All right. So now, let me show you some data that, that, uh, that then corroborates this idea, okay? Any questions, though, before I do that? Yeah, 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 here, and then I'll go there. Yeah, you go, for, you go first. Uh, so the main goal is now to understand what's the, what the RNAs have to do with proteins. Was the, the first observation that we had? Yeah. Trying to describe it in micro. No, 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 no. Good point. So, what Nadhar and Magasanic did was to ask, what does RNA have to do with protein synthesis? And their speculation was, well, maybe it's the ribosome that's driving protein synthesis. That's validated. That's clear. So here, I haven't done anything yet. I've just updated their view. But what I'm going to give you some foreshadowing, which is, as she suggested, she suggested, we're going to start fiddling with this. So they did not fiddle with this. They got this, rationalized the role of ribosome and protein synthesis, and that was the end of that, that avenue of research. But what we'll see is that fiddling with this opens up a whole box of, of, uh, of insight. If, wow, that was a terrible analogy. Uh, a, whole, a whole different view of what's going on in the cell. Okay, which comes to your other question, which is, or no, I think her other question, which was, what if we start fiddling with something else, like your question, the supply rate and things like this? Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. But I think in this framework, it's easier to see than in this framework where one has to keep manually converting units from RNAs to proteins. But you had a question. Oh, is that okay? Wait, I, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's important to distinguish the template RNA, which is being read, 
and the machinery that's reading it, which also contains RNA. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the template never has protein associated with it. Yeah. It's just an instruction set, yeah? But then the machinery always has protein associated with it. And, it. and whether it's active or inactive, it has the same content of protein associated with it. So because what happens is the machinery forms, and then it's formed, and it stays formed. And whether it's doing its job or not, it retains that uh, physical characteristic, that it's tangled of, it's RNA tangled with proteins. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's important because otherwise, this proportionality you couldn't carry through. Any other questions? All right. So let me show you some data then. And this is now it's something that another technological advance that I didn't talk about but is equally important is our access to mutants, which is something that Neidhart and Magasanic, it was incredibly laborious for them. You had to, you know, you would devote many postdocs and, and PhDs to try and find a few useful mutants. Now you just, I mean, it's a piece of cake. You can go in and strategically change pieces of the DNA of the organism at will. It would take you a week, maybe two. It's incredible. So what I'm going to talk about are some mutants that we can look at that were not, they weren't available until the mid-70s, but now you can make them in a couple of weeks. Okay, so this is a data that we had with Neidhart and Magasanic. But now I'm plotting the vertical axis as a protein fraction. So ribosomal protein to total protein. The shape of the line is the same. It's just that they, we have this proportionality between the RNA to protein ratio and the ribosomal protein ratio. All right, the colored symbols are different nutrients. So um, you know, warmer colors are the, are the least nutritious um, media. And then the greens have lots of vitamins and things like that. Um, and the sort of primary colors are glucose as a carbon source. The lighter colors are a different carbon source called glycerol. But the point here is that going along this line is changing the nutrient quality, which is what we've been talking about the past lectures. Uh, the squares are data from another lab. The diamonds are from another lab. The diamonds are from, I think, 1968. The squares are from 1976 different strains of E. coli. The purpose there is to show you that these, these measurements are incredibly robust. Lab to lab, day to day, strain to strain. Okay, they're in, in some way an intrinsic property of the bacterium. Okay, and as physicists, I, I think that's an appealing facet. Right? Okay, so now I want to talk more about, so that, that line is this line. And that intercept then is this, is this intercept I'm giving you the interpretation that it's an inactive fraction, but you could just think of it as a phenomenological parameter, that this data is strongly positively correlated. All right, it's so strongly correlated that you can compress all the data into a two-parameter fit. You could think of it that way if you prefer. I will, however, suggest that the interpretation of this as a translation rate is probably sound because I'm going to show you some data that corroborates that view. So I'll do that in one moment, but let me pause. Are there any questions about the data? It's okay? All right. So now, like I say, we have mutants. And so ignore the inset for a second. How am I going to do this? All right. These circles are like the data that I have over here. So circles correspond with circles. There's nothing wrong with these bacteria. These triangles have a mutation inside one of their ribosomal proteins that makes them produce protein much slower. And the reason that they do that is interesting in and of itself. They proofread. They're very fussy. And so they, they make sure that they make no mistakes, which makes them very slow. These up triangles are moderately slow. These down triangles are very slow. Right? And we know that because, as I said, we can make them produce protein inside a test tube, and we can measure how quickly they make protein. All right? And that's what's shown along the horizontal of this inset, is how quickly they make protein in a test tube. OK, is that uh, set up OK? And so these mutants, the triangles are mutants, 
make proteins more slowly per ribosome. That is to say, they're genetic changes that change that kappa T, if you believe that kappa T is the, the uh, translation rate. And what you see is it, I mean, it's hard because there's only four data points because these strains are quite sick and they don't grow in a lot of things. But the slope changes, the, in, the intercept is more or less constant, doesn't really matter. But you get this linear relationship retained, except now with a steeper slope. It takes more ribosomes to make the same amount of protein, if you like, in the same amount of time. And now if you take the slope and you take the reciprocal of the slope, that's what we interpret as this protein synthesis rate. And you plot that along the vertical and you plot this test tube translation rate along the horizontal, they corroborate very well. That is to say you get almost a perfect correlation between the two. And so that, that uh, suggests that our interpretation, at least of this parameter, is reasonable. So let me write that up while you, while you ponder the data, and then let's, let's talk about it. We'll talk about the numbered circles in a second. So we can look at, at uh, mutants. How do we provide How do we provide these mutants? So these ones came because they have a, a secondary uh, feature, which is that they're resistant to a particular antibiotic called streptomycin. And the streptomycin is an antibiotic that goes into the ribosome and then keeps it from making protein. The mutation that makes it so that that antibiotic doesn't bind also serendipitously makes it so that the ribosome double checks when it's protein synthesizing. So it has very low error rates, very slow procession speed. Did that, did that answer the question? So the way they found them was by screening for antibiotic resistance. And then when they measured the, what these resistant mutants did, they noticed, surprisingly, that they had very low growth rate and they made very few errors when producing protein. Okay, so this wasn't the original intent of those mutants. We, we took these mutants 30 years later and, and did this. So we can look at mutants um, with impaired uh, protein translation rate. So I'm, I'm going to distill this figure into a, a chalkboard version. And I put that figure up there so that you can see that I'm, I'm going to be making some uh, idealizing, uh, you know, these are going to be cartoon representations of that. Uh, and so you'll see the degree to which I exaggerate. <laughs> OK, so we have, oops. We have some different media, so I'll have, again, these different growth media, uh, growth rate is going to go like this. So this is slow, this is fast, and then we have mutants. So I've got this mutant one, which I'm going to use a dark color for. I have mutant two, which is going to be, or let's call this guy mutant two. This guy, I'm going to use stripes. And then I have my, my wild type. Oh, I have two mutant twos. This guy's mutant one. This guy's severe. And this is non. And so their protein translation speed is going to be like this, too. Slow, fast. And then what I want to do is, is plot the, the ribosomal abundance per growth rate in each of these media with each of these mutants. And that's the figure that I have on the right. But now, as I say, I'm going to idealize it in a cartoon like this. So now I have this ribosome mass fraction. And I have this uh, first line, which is going to be 0. And then 
this and then this. All right, and now I have a triangle, square, circle, circle, square, triangle. And I made this guy strong, the strong mutant, and this guy is the moderate mutant, and this guy is it. This, this is M2, M1, and this is what I call the wild type, so the parent. And this is a growth rate. Pardon me? Wild type is no mutant. This guy uh, is just the regular old strain. Okay, and I'm idealizing, but I, I, I'm doing it with a purpose. Okay, and so this is meant to represent that. And now if we take the slopes of these guys, and we look at their, so if we take the reciprocal slope, And what you end up with is, so one over slope, which is going to be this, is this kappa t parameter. And you look at the translation rate inside a test tube. Amino acids per second inside a test tube. You get an almost uh, perfect correlation. And so you would end up with Mutant one down here, uh, mutant two here, no, mutant two here, mutant one here, and wild type up here. Okay, so this this is meant to to substantiate or validate or at least rationalize to some extent this view that the reciprocal slope. So remember that this straight line relationship is empirical. We, it doesn't come from any sort of model in the background. It's like Boyle's law or something, or Mendel's laws of genetics. It operates at a very high level. Then we can go lower, and we can infer what each of the parameters in the, in the relationship mean. And one such inference is that this reciprocal slope is the translation rate per ribosome. And that came from that neidhardt magasanic interpretation that the RNA is, in some sense, a proxy of the ribosome abundance, and that ribosomes make proteins. Well, if that's true, then if we have mutants that have slower ribosomes, we should see this linear relationship, but now with a changed slope. The more slowly they translate, the steeper the slope. And that's indeed what we see. Okay, So that's, on the surface of it, what I wanted to show you, but there's something deeper going on here, which I'll talk about in a moment. So first. Any questions about the data? Does everybody see what I'm trying to get at? Anyone not clear on, on what I mean by mu M2, M1, and WT? OK, so I'll say one, one thing before that. So it's standard biological practice to call things wild type if you haven't broken them, if you haven't mutated them. I mean, it's a relative term, though, because everything's evolving <laughs> out in nature. And so that, say you happen to isolate some E. coli from a sewer 10 years ago and put it in your freezer, that becomes your lab's wild type. I mean, that's not advisable, but that's how people used to do it in the 50s. And then every mutant you make from that becomes a mutant strain relative to that so-called wild type. And so you'll see wild type throughout literature as sort of your canonical lab strain, if you like. Yeah, coming back to your question, though. What, what? Uh, yeah, OK. So the severity that the, this uh, qualitative um, distinction between severity, I'm making on the basis of their growth rate. So if I have, uh, so for example, it's easiest probably to see in the light blue strains. Uh, no, I mean, it's easier to see in the dark blue. So dark blue is all in the same growth medium. So the recipe inside the test tube is the same. But the guys with the downward pointing triangles grow about half as quickly as the circles do. So their diet's exactly the same, but one of them grows twice as fast. 
Okay, and so I would say that the one who's twice as slow or half as fast is severely is a severe mutant. It it shows a lot of change. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Of the horizontal axis, amino acids per second. Sorry, yeah. So here they can they can look in the in the test tube and count how quickly amino acids are assimilated into proteins by these ribosomes. So again, you've got a test tube, you've got ribosomes that are extracted from these cells but purified. You add energy, you add amino acids, and you add some other sort of you know ions to make sure that everything's in happy. And then you let it go, and it makes protein at a certain rate. You measure how quickly it's making protein, and that will tell you how fast these guys are operating. Yeah? So we are very safe from the RNA to the ribosome. Yeah, right, exactly. So the slope of this line then would tell you what these, what these proportionality constants are. Exactly. But there's, that's exactly true, but there's a, there's a, subtle point, which is that we can't get protein to pr get produced as quickly as in the cell in a test tube. So you'll get this M and the sigma for test tube protein translation, which is, which is fine. And then you just say, well, probably there's another factor from the test tube to the bacterium. Is that OK? OK. Any other questions? All right. So we've more or less in the last hour or so, retrod the, I mean, there was some preamble, but we've retrod the, or, or walked over again, the Megasanic Neidhart paper of 1960. Um, and really all we've done is changed our units and looked at some mutants to corroborate this picture, okay? But what I'm suggesting to you is that, although it's not, I haven't sort of labored the point yet, there's more going on in this figure, okay? And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in five minutes. So why don't we take a break? But before we do that, there are other ways besides genetic mutation to slow down the translation rate. And one of those ways is by adding antibiotic. Okay. And so when we were talking earlier about how do you fiddle with this translation rate, if you add an antibiotic, like for example, there's an antibiotic called chlorophenicol, which you use to treat eye infections, its chief mode of action is to go and jam into the ribosome so that it can't take in amino acids. And it's fairly reversible. And so it goes in there, comes out, goes in there, comes out. And the net effect is that these ribosomes translate more slowly. Okay? And that's that dashed line. And so I want to come back to that after the break. But let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, why don't we take a break and come back in five minutes. Any questions? Good. OK, I'll see you in five minutes. Some things <laughs> that came out of that. All right. So I, um, OK, two things. Now, maybe I'll erase this, and then let's talk about it. Because we have you know, the pictures over there on the, on the left. OK, and so I want to tell you the relationship conceptually between this parameter and the protein translation rate. Before I do that, oh good, it's coming around. OK. So remember, we have this mRNA, this template RNA. We have this ribosome. And it's making, sorry, its whole job is to take free amino acids and covalently bond them with other free amino acids, well, to a chain of, of amino acids, to make a protein. So this is protein. which is a polymer, and the monomer is this amino acid. So we got about 20 of them. And the, the sequence within which you join them gives the polymer that forms special properties. These are the enzymes and the, and the operational proteins in the cell. Okay, This is not a D. This is an amino acid circle. Okay. And this translation right down here is how quickly one ribosome takes this and sticks it into this chain. Okay, in chemicals, it would look something like this. You'll have a 
ribosomal protein is going to take in some amino acid and it's going to make protein plus ribosomal protein. So this guy is the same thing as this thing. It's like an enzyme. It's converting amino acids into proteins. And this rate of reaction is this kappa T. Or sorry, no, is this, uh, well, yes. We think is kappa T. The rate of this reaction we think of as K. So K is amino acids per second per ribosome, so it's numbers. This kappa T, if everything is this, you know, our interpretation is correct, it's the exact same scenario, but now per protein gram inside of this ribosome. And we do that so that we can get this uh, fraction. So it's just a unit's conversion, which means that if we plot the translation rate, this K on one axis, and this kappa, which again is an empirical parameter, right? it's, it's just you take a, a ruler, stick it on your plot, and measure the, the, the rise over the run. If we take that slope, that kappa t, and we plot it on the vertical, we should see a straight line that goes through the origin. And the slope of that straight line is a proportionality constant between the rate of protein synthesis per ribosome in our test tube and the rate or, and this slope on our, uh, the rate of protein synthesis per gram of pr ribosome in our cells. I think I made that muddy toward the end. But are there any, so are there any questions about the meaning or the interpretation of this plot, which is this inset here? This inset is meant to suggest or meant to convince you that this empirical slope is actually what we think it is. We, it, it's the rate of translation per ribosome. Let me pause. Is that, does anyone have any questions about that? Boy, I don't know if I made that clearer or much worse. It's a, it's a reaction rate, if you like, K. And I'm saying kappa T is also the same reaction rate. And my evidence for that is this inset. OK. Point number two, these guys are like different species. So you can think of them as like a cat, dog, bunny rabbit. And I change the colors for each species by changing what I feed them. So the straight lines are, with the triangles pointing down, would be bunny rabbits, different diets. Then cats, different diets are the up triangles. And then dogs, different diets are the circles. Okay. And so these are completely independent experiments of one another. And these guys are the creatures upon which I'm doing this experiment. I hope that was clear, or is now clear. Is that now clear? All right. Last thing that I wanted to say is this. This denominator necessarily includes ribosomal proteins. Because when I chemically measure the protein content, I can't distinguish in the bulk measurement that I'm doing ribosomal protein from regular protein. Or not that I can't, I don't. This is a total protein. Which means that this fraction is somewhere between 0 and 1. And that's important. OK? So let me go through those one more time. This thing is the same as this thing. If you, or that's what I'm trying to convince you with this plot. OK. Second point is this ratio is always between 0 and 1. Those are the two takeaways I want you to have in the next five minutes. So, I mean, we'll carry it on to the next five minutes. But let me pause. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. So that line, that, that hard, uh, solid line, should pass through the origin. And so there, what I have here is the best fit between those three points. And it doesn't pass through the origin. <coughs> Equally, what I could have done is constrained it to fit through the origin. But then that imposes 
that imposes my own beliefs on the on the interpretation. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, if we're if the interpretation is correct, then it passes through zero. And so, uh, this error here, I, I I think there there are two sources. One is the error bars on these, and the error in our interpretation. And so, if both of those are if that error is small, then both those errors hopefully are also small. But again, there's no guarantee, right? And so, this that's is that okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. So. This points to a larger picture, which is that um, it's also true in physics, but more so in biology, where we have indirect evidence. I want you to think of these as, as, a, as a court case, basically. And you're the jury, and I'm trying to convince you. All right? And so I can give you this kind of evidence, but you, you, you look at it and you say, well, I'm not, you're not really a reliable witness. <laughs> right? You have a vested interest in this. And so you look at this and you ask, you know, what kind of errors are going on? Okay, okay, I'll take that. And then you look for other, bless you, circumstantial evidence. And what you want is for all the forks of evidence to be pointing in the same direction. You don't want there to be some convincing, contradictory evidence anywhere. Now, of course, I'm, I'm the one who's presenting this. And so if there was contradictory evidence and I was unscrupulous, I wouldn't show it to you. But the point here is that her question, why doesn't this go through the origin, is a perfectly valid jury type question. And so if you're looking for a reasonable doubt, that might be one. And you write that down when you're going to do your final deliberation. Does everybody know what I mean? And so the, what, what I said to her, and, I, and, and I'll say it again in different words, is that if you believe this interpretation that the slope is the translation rate, the slope of that line is, is the translation rate, well, then this dark line should pass through the origin, and it does not. And so my suggestion is that that be comes because there are errors in the data. But then you can come back to me and say, no, no, no. Maybe the er errors in the data are just fine. It's an error in your interpretation. And that's fine. And then, we're at a, then, then we, we leave these two contradictory ideas up in the air. And then you come back at me and say, provide me with some evidence that this is really the translation rate, if you like. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It's like a courtroom drama. Well, it's probably less exciting to watch. Well, I hope not. Maybe it's the same. All right. OK, but is this interpretation OK? Now, I keep, I keep harping on this. I, I, I want to keep my interpretation distinct from the data. And I think that's important, too. Right? It's very, very easy to do what we call reify, where we have some data, like this straight line, and we have a slope. And instead of calling it the slope, I keep calling it the translation rate. I mean, I don't do that. But one can do that, which is imposing a view on the data that is not there. Right? There's the data, and then there's our interpretation of the data. And although it's tedious, at least in this, in this course, I'm going to keep them distinct as, as much as I can. Because I think it's, it facilitates the learning. OK. Pause, though. Well, it's OK? OK. Now, I said before the break that, that the, the point of interest that I wanted to draw your attention to was this, this dashed line. And and what I meant to not do was erase that <laughs> plot. <laughs> All right. Oh, it'll just have to do. I'll have to use the data. Um, although it's not altogether clear in this picture, the different colors are, are different nutrients. So I'm feeding them different things. And if you squint, it looks a little bit like each color has its own set of lines going through it. I mean, it's not as convincing because there's quite a bit of scatter, and there are only three points. But now, another way that you can affect this translation rate, like I said, is not through genetic mutation, but through the addition of antibiotics. Okay? And that's what I want to talk about now. And I think, yeah, I think that this will work out very well. Okay. So instead of genetic mutation, we can um, alter or inhibit the protein translation rate or protein synthesis rate with antibiotics. And 
so clinically, I mean, in the 50s, we had this boom of, of uh, research activity in, in antibiotics. And these are chemicals that inhibit bacterial growth. And they do that through a number of ways. One of the largest families of antibiotics, which is not really used too much anymore because of resistance, is protein synthesis inhibitors. And so these are often chemicals that look a lot like amino acids that just jam the works. So it's like you've got a, you know, maybe a paper press or something, something synthesizing, and you just keep standing next to it and jamming in a wrench. That's what these antibiotics do. Okay, so for example, the one that I want to talk about, and the, and the, the, um, the sort of the, the name of the antibiotic is not important unless it's of interest to you. The one that I'm going to talk about is chloramphenicol. Uh, and as I say, it's not really used clinically except if you have an eye infection. Um, so what I'm going to do now is take a, go back to this graph. I'm going to say take light blue, which is some particular medium composition. And I'm going to break that up into six test tubes and add no antibiotic, a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So now that light blue circle test tube has an increasing concentration of antibiotic in it. I'm going to inoculate with bacteria, and I'm going to let these cells resume exponential growth. So it's not enough antibiotic to kill them. It is enough to make them grow more slowly. Okay, so what I'll do is take, for example, what did I have here? Circle, square, triangle. So this was growth rate. And this is this uh, protein, ribosomal protein mass fraction. I'll take one of these, and I'll add antibiotic to it. Okay, so now I've got sort of, you know, so these are all squares. And then my antibiotic concentration goes like this. So the feedstock that I'm giving them, the composition of what's in the test tubes, is the same in all the test tubes. But what's different is the amount of antibiotic, i.e. the inhibition of their, of their protein synthesis. Does everybody see the scenario? OK. Now the question becomes, what happens to this square if I start to measure the, the ribosome protein and divide it by the total protein? So I add antibiotic, it's going to grow more slowly. So each of these test tubes is going to appear sort of further to the left, because that's what an antibiotic does. Now the question is, what happens to the ribosome content? Is everybody comfortable with what I'm about to do? So this is like a rabbit out of a hat. You might already be able to tell from the um, rightmost figure. What we get is an increase in the ribosomal protein fraction. And so here, different colored lines correspond to their, uh, their cognate uh, uh, initial points. And the numbers are the concentrations of this antibiotic. And so the reason that I told you the name is so that it wouldn't be confusing to see that blue line. So these are the concentrations in micromolar of, uh, of chloramphenicol. Does everybody see what's happening? So, the solid black line was that line by Neidhart and Magasanic that we saw before. Then you start at any given color, like light blue, and you start to add more and more chloramphenicol, and you parametrically move up a line of negative slope. So this was now something that I had called phi r min. And what happens as you add antibiotic is something more or less like this. The intercept's not as clean as I've got it here, but we'll come to that. That make sense? And so this is with chloramphenicol. I'll call it CM. And this is nutrient. So the better the nutrient, the faster you grow. The more the chloramphenicol, the slower you grow. 
And then we have some intercept here. And so what I want to suggest is that we now have a secondary relationship that has some at least superficial resemblance to that Neidhart and Megasonic relationship. We end up with a family of uh, lines that again, so we end up with now a negative correlation between the ribosome abundance and the growth rate. But that correlation is so strong that again, we can compress the data more or less into a line for each um, growth medium. Let's say nutrient condition. So we now look at the, the ribosomal protein fraction it's going to be negatively related to the growth rate. And the slope now I'm going to denote by kappa n. Well, have 1 over kappa n. For now, we don't know what that means. It's just an empirical fit. You tell me the growth rate that you started with. You say dark green. I say, oh, OK, kappa n is 4.6. It's, it's just a fit. And then we have some intercept which I'll call phi r max for, uh, for symmetry. So this now is phi r max. Now there's, you can see there's some spread in the phi r max. And in fact, it, there's some weak growth dependence in that intercept. But to a zeroth order approximation, probably first order approximation, <laughs> we've got a more or less growth independent intercept and then a slope that depends upon where you started from because of the growth independence in this intercept. And so we have this second relationship where this guy appears to correlate with what I'm going to call nutrient quality, which is not a quantitative term. <laughs> OK, and then this is some approximately growth rate dependent intercept. And again, that's an empirical fit, or if you like, a family of empirical fits. And I've offered no, uh, no interpretation to either of those parameters yet. And if you like, think about how you might rationalize them. And if you, if you feel even more ambitious, think about how you would test that rationalization independently of this data. All right, let me pause. Does everybody see what I've done? So initially, in the previous picture, what I had was mutants, genetically altered uh, different species, if you like, of bacteria. Well, not really different species. They're still E. coli, but I've gone in there with a screwdriver and ruined their genetics. Okay, that gave me a discrete march with different uh, slopes. But I can get a continuum um, sampling of that same process by adding an antibiotic. Now, you notice that, that for example, all the twos don't really nicely line up on the same line. But there's no, there's no reason that they should. I mean, it's not, it's not a priori necessary that the bacterium will perceive the same concentration as the same amount of inhibition inside. For genetics, it should. But for chemicals, it, sh it doesn't need to. Well, that's fine, because we're using this as a parametric um, variable, if you like. We're twisting the concentration of antibiotic, and that scoots us up and down this colored line. So another way to think of this, then, is that we've got this space, ribosomal protein fraction and growth rate, tiled not by vertical and horizontal lines, but by these overlapping uh, diagonals. So we've got one parameter that gives you the kappa t's, and then we have one parameter that gives you the kappa n's. So it's like a change of coordinates, <laughs> if you want to think of it that way. But what I want to talk about, then, 
after lunch, so let's, let's break for some uh, questions and then we'll break for lunch, is the interpretation of this guy and this guy. Okay, but let me pause first. Uh, are there any questions about the experiment, the data, anything? Yeah. Uh, what does it take into consideration how many vegetarian systems of bacteria over antibiotics? Or is it only the yeah, yeah. So these, we will talk about that um, on probably on Monday. So the question is, what about resistance to this antibiotic? These, uh, that's, that's cool, right? Yeah. So these uh, empty circles have no intrinsic resistance to the antibiotic. That is to say, they don't have any proteins that confer much resistance. You can find strains that do make proteins that, that uh, um, what do you call it? Um, deactivate the, the antibiotic, so they enzymatically change it. Uh, and we'll talk about what effect that has on the growth rate. But for here, these guys are susceptible. They have no genetic predisposition to be resistant to these. If we let this experiment go on for months or weeks or even hours, days, let's say, you could start to see uh, mutants emerge that were resistant to the antibiotic. But this experiment's not done on those time scales. It's only a few hours long. Was that, was that the worry? Did we see mutants? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here, here all of the ribosomes are inactive in our interpretation, right? They, they're, if there were any, they would be making protein, the cell would be growing. Up there, there's a huge number of them. They're all possibly active. There's some, still some small offsets, say, of inactive. But they're not translating at any, it's, they're translating at a zero rate. So they're, whether you want to call them inactive or active, is, is, is sort of semantic, but at least as you take that limit, what you have is uh, as many, many more ribosomes than you typically would. They're all active, but their protein production rate is very slow, tending towards zero. So here, what we're turning, so if our synthesis rate is, uh, is something, I guess I'll erase these guys. Uh, exactly. So if this is lambda m, which is this k times n ribosomes active, say, the bottom one is when this goes to zero. The top one is when this goes to zero. Is that okay? That would be the interpretation. Any other questions? It's okay? That's our time. Like, good. Okay, so why don't we break for lunch, and I'll see you guys at like 2.30 or something. I think, yeah, did everyone who wanted to sign this sign this? Okay, all right, I'll see you guys after lunch.